Tunis seized control of the government. Tutsi of all ages were left without refuge. <laughs> They were hunted down and killed in their homes, at roadblocks, in schools, in churches. In 100 days, as many as 800,000 people, including three out of every four Tutsi in Rwanda, were murdered. You can't imagine the smell, the sound of dogs eating units. Throughout the night, how many? Right hundreds of seeing children and living amongst the corpses of their families. Because there's no else to go to the nobody could pick them up at the time. In the middle of this horror were General Delea and the poorly equipped UN force sent to keep a peace that the extremists had suddenly violently shattered. You have no food, water, fuel, medical supplies, defensive stores, because none of the contracts had been signed six months into the mission by the UN staff. Countries had not provided troops with equipment, so you've got uh, Bangladeshi troops coming in with not even a pot to be able to cook their food. Three months before the genocide began, General Dover had learned of extremist plans for mass murder and told his UN superiors that he was going to seize an arms cache. The response was immediate, within hours, that uh, I was not authorized, it was outside my mandate, uh, and that I was jeopardizing the whole mission. Well, on the 6th of uh, April, the war started. Within 24 hours, I had 10 soldiers dead, but already thousands of ones were being slaughtered. After the killing started, General Dallaire requested more forces to stop the murders. Within the first few days of the Rwandan war and the genocide, Kofi Annan went to all 69 countries, not one of them, one of them provided one soldier. Although no nation would send troops to help the Rwandans, Western soldiers did arrive to evacuate Westerners. And so all the within five days, picked up what they had left the Rwandans who had served them for years, decades, who raised their kids, left them to be slaughtered behind, and went back to Brussels and Paris and all these other places. The world turned its back on Rwanda. Two weeks into the genocide, the UN Security Council voted to reduce Dallaire's force to a token level. Killing continued for weeks. 100 days after it began, the genocide ended when a Tutsi-led rebel force, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, drove the genocidal government out of the country. General Dallaire left Rwanda in August 1994. He still struggles with the memory of what he witnessed. You just can't walk through all that blood and all that gore and all that sound. Did I or should I walk up to Kofi Annan or Bhutto Skelly and throw my commission in front of him and say, the hell with you, nobody's coming, so I'm going. Should I commence opening fire? The first morning, it was made very clear to me that if I opened fire, I would become the third belligerent because then it's open season. But with the force I had, no way that I could open fire and guarantee the security of my force. I didn't have enough ammunition to be able to hold out in the fire pipe for more than half an hour. No, there is no conceivable way of actually being able to walk away uh, from the immensity of what it is. And imagine the moral dilemmas we have of all those people calling and screaming at the end of the phone for me to send troops to get them. And hearing the people smashing down the door and shooting at the end of the phone. 
or deciding which ones I could go and rescue and which ones I couldn't go and rescue. Of the moral dilemma of a soldier who's all of a sudden seeing a crowd encouraging a girl of 14, 15 with a machete and a child on her back to kill another girl of 14, 15 with a child on her back. What do my soldiers? They're held up at, a, at, a, at a, the entrance of the village and you see these hundreds of people edging on this girl to kill them all. Do my soldiers open fire into the crowd? Killing God knows how many injury to go save that girl. Does the corporal, who's 19, 20, 21, coming out of our same schools, does that corporal take his sniper and orders it to shoot the girl with the machete, probably killing her child? Does the corporal simply walk away? What is it? What's the answer? What is the answer? What will he be held accountable? Morally, what will he be held accountable technically? If he had an open fire, he was directly against the mandate, and God knows what the reaction was. He didn't open fire. He negotiated and negotiated, and as he's negotiating, this girl was being chopped up in her stomach. And the crowd roared. And then it was finished. That corporal of 21 came back home. And back home, we have night line, and we have hockey, and we have everything else. The country's not at war. There's no war. War that didn't affect our security. They went there because there was a belief that there were humans who needed help and found totally incapable of providing that help. And they come back with this new generation of injury called post-traumatic stress syndrome that in fact protects the brain. Because those moral dilemmas not being solved remain. And that's what we think. Imagine what the world is say. I sent a, a section of two vehicles to a house where we suspected there were people there that needed to be pulled out. They didn't find them. So they came back, and the next day, I said, go check just in case. The next day, they went, and the whole family was slaughtered on the floor. They didn't find it because the family wasn't sure whether or not they were UN or simply people dressed up and using the UN. So they hid in the ceiling. The militia saw the troops going to that house. They tore the place apart and slaughtered them. Sometimes you're wondering whether going to help them was putting them in danger. This is not four or five people on a block. This is thousands upon thousands upon weeks and weeks and weeks. And the Western world sat there. You've got to start wondering about the depth of your belief in the moral values, the ethical values, and your belief in humanity. All humans are human. There are no humans more human than others. That's it. It is circular 
because public opinion is rarely, if ever, aroused by foreign crises, even genocidal ones, in the absence of political leadership. And at the same time, American leaders continually cite the absence of public support as grounds for inaction. So it's a circle of inaction. The public doesn't care if they don't have leadership. The leadership says we can't exercise leadership because the public doesn't care. And I believe that Holocaust remembrance can play an important role in breaking that circle of inaction that she describes. And I believe that breaking it must be our long-term goal. I believe also that we can't lose heart because it takes the long term in order to achieve it. In the name of remembrance and with all of the moral authority that it entails, we must prod political leaders to exercise leadership, to respond to genocide and threats of genocide, and convince the American people that it is the right thing to do. But we must also work on the other side of the relationship. Holocaust remembrance can help create a conceit of conscience that is aroused by threats of genocide in the present and future, that demands action to stop mass murder, that holds to account policymakers who temporize. But even so, even so, do we really have grounds to hope that the example of the Holocaust, or do we have grounds for hope when we have before? the example of the Holocaust. Can it really make a difference? Or is that just a futile exercise to find some light in a darkness that is purely irredeemably evil? The writer Cynthia Ozick once criticized what she called, quote, an urge in the direction of redemption that she perceived in discussions of the Holocaust. Let us get some good out of this, we tell ourselves. Let us look for spots of goodness on the rump she said. She termed that view unacceptable. In thinking about the Holocaust, she said, quote, we have to take into ourselves a different possibility, an alien thesis, one that we have never been taught, one that goes against our moral grain, that seems overwhelmingly indigestible and repugnant. It is that this time there was no redemption. She goes on to assert that we cannot redemption out of events that are in their nature not amenable to redemption. Such events can produce only their own kind. The only thing, Cynthia was success, that the Holocaust can give birth to is further images of itself. Never again is not the message we get from the Holocaust. The message we get is that the Holocaust will replicate itself. Once the restraints are down, time becomes easier. The next time, we'll have a precedent and a model. What was acceptable once will be acceptable again. What was acceptable once will be acceptable again. The utter darkness into which so many people disappeared is so deep and so black that we have to give weight to what Cynthia Ozick is saying here, to her warmth. We must avoid the temptation to, as she says, pry redemption out of the darkness merely as a false comfort to ourselves and our seeming safety. But I think she goes too far. According to the darkness and inevitability that renders us powerless, stripping from us for all time any choice. Certainly, what has happened once can happen again. We know that's true. But what she says is that it will happen again and again and again for all eternity. And what I contend is that in the space between what can happen and what will happen is where we stand. And what we do, what we choose, quite simply whether we stand by or stand up, can make all the difference in the world. 
And this image of choice conjures a very specific memory for me. Many years ago, I was stationed in Germany, near Nuremberg, as a member of the United States Army. And one summer, I volunteered to help with the American military community's Special Olympics. Well, we held the Special Olympics in Nuremberg at what we call Soldier Stadium, but what the Germans call Zeppelin Field. And it was this vast stadium where the Nazis held their huge party rallies in the 1930s. And I know this is part of an iconic image that we all have engraved in our collective memories. Torch lights, banners, uniforms, Hitler, and histrionics at the speaking scene. And that's where we held our Special Olympics. Special Olympics, the Nazis wanted to exterminate handicapped people handicapped kids because they were useless eaters. Life unworthy of life. We have special Olympics. And those two very different outcomes were the products of choices that people, individuals and groups made. One set of choices led to Auschwitz, the other to special Olympics. What people choose is a difference. And we can build a better world, a world where there's, if not no genocide, less genocide, if we choose to. There's a psychology professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst named Erwin Stahl. He's written a classic work called The Roots of Evil, about the psychology of mass, mass violence. And he explained in The Roots of Evil that bystanders People who witness but are not directly affected by the actions of perpetrators help shape society by their reactions. They can define the meaning of events and move others toward empathy or indifference. They can promote values and norms of caring or by their pa passivity or participation in the system affirm truth that he's articulated there. People who witness help shape society by their reactions. They can promote values and norms of caring, or they can affirm the perpetrators through their passivity. In the main hall of the Holocaust Museum is inscribed a passage which actually was at the, in the opening titles of that film. It's a passage from the book of Isaiah. It says, you are my This passage in the museum works on several levels. Most obviously, it's underscoring the fact that when people come to the Holocaust Memorial Museum, they themselves are becoming witnesses to the enormity of the Holocaust. It also echoes the explanation that General Dwight Eisenhower gave for insisting on visiting newly liberated camps. I made the visit to Lipset in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations to propaganda. Witness, in other words, protects against the distortion or denial of history. Finally, the passage from Isaiah is an admonition. An admonition using the presence to imply a continuing obligation on all of us to bear witness to the crimes of today as well as the crimes of yesterday. And as Professor Staub says, people who witness help shape society. We are witnesses, and as witnesses, we have a choice. The choice of promoting values and norms of caring, or the choice of affirming the perpetrators. Holocaust helps us make the choice. It is a powerful, powerful spur to choose values and norms of care. Over 50 years ago, the Nobel, Nobel laureate Albert Camus wrote a book called The Plague. How many of you have read The Plague? Not so many. The Plague is, is basically a morality tale. 
And he recounts how the citizens of a city called Iran, it's actually a real city in Algeria, but how the citizens of the city of Iran confronted the challenge of a deadly pestilence, a plague that swept through the city and was killing their friends and their neighbors, put them all at risk. The novel was a response in its most immediate sense to the French experience under the Nazi occupation. But at this remove, we can fully appreciate its timelessness and its truth. All the citizens reacted in very different ways. Some people profited from the crisis. Others gave up. Others fought back, tried to save lives. And one of those characters, Dr. Ryu, comments, when you see the suffering it brings, you have to be mad, blind, or a coward to resign yourself to the plague. And that's the role that remembrance of the Holocaust can play the pestilence of genocide today. It forces us to see the suffering, the suffering the plague brings. It awakens us to the fact that we all of us live in Camus or Iran. It underscores that we are making a choice and by so doing, points us to the right choice. So I close again with words from Camus. On this earth, there are pestilences, and there are victims. And as far as one must refuse to be on the side of the pestilence. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.
60 years since the Holocaust that we've provided refuge to a lot of people. Often, though, that was refuge based on ideological considerations. And even today, people who come from Cuba, which, make no mistake about it, is an oppressive regime that violates human rights on a daily basis. But because it's a con regime, people from Cuba find it very easy if they can make it to dry land in Florida to get refuge in the United States. People coming from Haiti, which today is a very desperate place, for many years has had a lot of political repression, they don't have the same rights. It's an ideological difference. And I think what we should aspire to is, is something that's a little bit more based on principle, the principle that the people have a well-founded fear of persecution. They can't asylum. Yes, sir. What you were saying here today, it seems like the League of Nations is bankrupt. The United Nations is bankrupt. Who is going to be the policeman of the world? We are. The business of coalition building and everything else has to go. We have to make the decision here. I'll take that as a question. <laughs> uh, I think you raise. You know, I think you raise a very important point, and I think that if you look at uh, the situation, in, if you look at Kosovo, okay, if you probably studied Kosovo here, we had. I'll tell you my version of the story. In the 1990s, we had Bosnia and we had Rwanda. No response to failure, really. Uh, then in. As the 90s progressed, by 1998, in, in Kosovo, Slobodan Milosevic, who was really the architect of Bosnia, is starting to do a lot of the same stuff. It was like deja vu all over again. And to their credit, the people in the Clinton administration said, well, for God's sakes, we can't let a third genocide happen on our, our watch. And so um, they were pretty committed to trying to stop Milosevic. But ultimately, what happened was an intervention that was done. It was not a United Nations intervention. And it would have been futile for them to go to the United Nations because Russia, in the Security Council, could not have voted in favor of the intervention for political reasons because of their longstanding ties to the Serbs in favor of, uh, um, the, uh, of an intervention. And so if there was going to be an intervention, it had to be without explicit UN authority, although there were UN resolutions that told Slobodan and Milosevic to cease and desist from what he was doing. And, and that presents a, and one that we have to deal with, is that generally in the whole world, the United Nations and the actions of the Security Council have uh, a certain amount of legitimacy. But on the other hand, it's very easily paralyzed. And if it's paralyzed and you've got a choice between legitimacy and, and response, how do you resolve that dilemma? And a situation which was not actually currently genocidal, although you know the regime of Saddam Hussein uh, uh, pretty included a genocide in the past against his Kurdish minority, um, presented this, the same situation. And I imagine in a place like Sonoma State, there are a lot of people who opposed the policy that the United States undertook. And in a lot of ways, it was very different than Kosovo. A lot less uh, um, willingness to try to build as broad a coalition as possible. And I think that that's the dilemma that we have to confront. We can't just say, uh, look, the UN is the responsible international body and it has to approve this. It doesn't, you know, it fails. But on the other hand, uh, you know, what will the world look like if it's just one country that's unilaterally doing whatever? What legitimacy will it have? So where do we, com where do we find the combination of power and legitimacy? And I think that's a very difficult choice and a very difficult problem. One that all citizens need to be engaged in. Yeah. So, what is our call to action? What, is, what would you say this generation actually effectively can do now? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of these decisions are made on levels in the government that I personally can never get an opportunity to vote on or have a say on. So, what is the call to action? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say the call to action is that, and, and, and it's implicit in that quotation from Samantha Power, okay? There's a circle, she talks about a circle in the next. Leaders won't do anything because the public doesn't care. The public doesn't care unless leaders care. 
you can make a difference in that circle. Because one thing about our, you know, without being Pollyannish, one thing about our government is, is they do care about what people care about. And if you look at Sudan, okay, it wasn't just the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum saying, you know, like there's a threat of genocide in Sudan. That was a factor. But another reason why this president, who before he came into office said, you know, genocide is really not our problem. The reason he cared about Sudan was that a lot of people in his political constituency, basically faith-based constituency, and there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill who care about it because they have constituents who care about it. And so you as one individual are a lone voice. But you're in a community here, a community where you have easy access to people. And you can, you can organize. And going forward, you can organize, whether you're a member of a church or you're a member of of a local chapter of Amnesty International, or you're a member of whatever ever group, you can make it part of that group business to care about threats of genocide, and then communicate that care to, to your representatives in Congress and to the president. And that helps break the circle of inaction. When Rwanda was happening, there were uh, uh, there were people inside the Beltway, Human Rights Watch, in, probably familiar with the organization Human Rights Watch, which is a great organization that documents human rights abuses, very expert, but, but very, you know, say, inside the Beltway. Okay? They, don't, they don't have members, really, across the country. And they're going into the National Security Council, you know, the White House, and saying, I did do something about Rwanda. Why, why aren't you doing more? And the, one of the responses they got was, well, we're not hearing anything about Rwanda. You're not hearing. I'm calling you every day. What do you mean? They're like, no, we're not hearing anything from any place outside the Beltway. And that was true. There wasn't really any mass response to Rwanda. And that could have made a difference if there were people. It's not all that makes a difference. It's still you have to push, you have to struggle. But, but that's what you can do. That's the call to action, is to, to organize and speak and to take an active role on these issues. If I could just say something, maybe this is ready to say you, you said people who witness help shape society. And I would say that one of the things that's happened is we no longer get to witness. This is something about the media, what kind of role does the media play? Right. Or what kind of role do you think the media should play? We increasingly do not get the kind of information we need to make a principled uh, decision or to get into that circle of inaction. So I would say that one of the places to start is to start demanding that the media or supporting the media that does not give us entertainment all the time does report to us about what is going on in the world. I think that's really true. If you look, it's kind of a, uh, a commonplace in the media world that people don't care about foreign affairs. And you look at the budgets of big media organizations and they've got fewer, far fewer people uh, deployed overseas. And if you look today, you know, all people who are deployed overseas are in one place covering one story. And the result is that you're not getting that much information about other stories. Well, can you as individuals influence that? There's a limit to what you can do, but you have a paper here. And if that paper heard from you and heard from people that they need to be covering about Sudan or covering more about Africa or whatever, they're going to respond to that. They're a business like anyone else. And what they're responding to is a perception that people don't care about this, that if they run the stories, people don't read it. And if they don't read it, the, the media businesses don't make money. And so, so it's kind of the same principle as with, uh, with Congress. They're responsive to the public. This is not all a top-down a top thing. You know, there's uh, a chance to have
he doesn't care what you sitting right there think. Okay? He doesn't. He's down in Burbank or Florida, wherever it is he, he operates. But the fact is that um, ABC is on your TV, you know, and they're affiliated for ABC. It may even be an ABC on a station. And they're a lot closer to you, and they care what you think. And ABC cares about keeping those people happy. As I just go back to say, it's not all one way. It's the other way. And ultimately, Disney, Disney's in a lot of trouble, okay? Disney's in trouble because ABC's in trouble because people don't watch it, okay? Well, why is that? There are a lot of complicated reasons. But they have to care about why people aren't watching it. And if there are people who say, look, what we want to watch is Nightline. I mean, look what happened to Nightline, the most serious show on TV. And rid of it. And there was an outcry because there are serious people who care about Nightline. Ted Koppel was the one who did the interview with Romeo Dallaire. Okay? It's this very small victory in this battle to keep serious stuff in the mass media. But it was a victory. And those victories can be won. And we can't, you know, we've got two choices. We can throw up our hands and say, the hell with it. You're not going, so I'm leaving. You know, that was the dilemma that the Lair faced. Or we can try to figure out ways that we can make a difference. And our choices. We can affirm values and norms of caring. Or through our passivity, we can affirm the perpetrators. Not to say that Eisner is a perpetrator of genocide, but you know what we do 